ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Good evening and welcome to uh, the second evening program of our Futurosity Summit. Um, my pleasure to welcome you here this evening. My name is Yuri Mason. I'm the uh, Associate Director of uh, Education and uh, Public Affairs here at Witte de Wit. Um, yes, and as I said, this is the second evening of our two-day uh, summit program around the notion of Futurosity. Um, this year marks the 500th anniversary of the word utopia. It was introduced uh, to us by uh, Thomas More in a book in uh, 1516. Um, and he gave us a term we kind of all uh, uh, dream of, a word we can now hardly imagine being without. Um, and his book imagined a fictional Atlantis, a fictional city in the sea, which, uh, in which social order was perfect. You know? uh, equality, um, uh, goodness, harmony between people um, was all perfectly realized. And the question, of course, is was this a, uh, a dream, a future scenario, or was it more a satire on the England of the day? How do uh, ideas about the future speak about possible futures or about uh, current predicaments? Um, and this is what, what uh, our summit is also dealing with, the question of uh, what the future is, to what extent the future uh, still is a relevant term um, when in a time when nothing seems more certain than change. In a time when every prediction seems to have a certain end game scenario to it. Uh, currently, there, if you look in popular uh, fiction, there's very little uh, utopias left, I think. Um, and as such, we ask the question, is the future itself starting to be an outdated concept that we need to move beyond, perhaps, with the, this summit? Um, tonight we have three great uh, speakers for you. We'll start with uh, Helen Hester, uh, followed by Charlie Colas, and then uh, Lisbeth von Zonen. Uh, but first, before we introduce our speakers of tonight, I have to thank our uh, partners in this project. The first being Rotterdam Viert de Stad. Rotterdam celebrates the city. Uh, for this year marks the 75th anniversary of the uh, reconstruction of the city's heart after its destruction in World War II. Um, and with our program Futurosity, we contribute to the public debate around the idea that Rotterdam is a city that has been looking toward the future more than to the past to shape its identity. And as well, we have to thank the Art of Impact, a, uh, a national partner, and together with them we investigate questions of the future which go also beyond cities, uh, beyond the scale of the city, more towards personal or uh, societal scales. And um, uh, we ask the question, which kind of contingency fictional, artistic or otherwise, can empower the notion of future in the 21st century. Now this program has been set up uh, together with our partners of Kunstblock and uh, to introduce uh, the first speaker I'd like to invite Natalie Hachjes, the director of MAMA, uh, onto the stage. Uh, for now I wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Um, it's so funny because you always start these like notes with, uh, my name is Natalie Hartjes, I'm director of MAMA, but you, uh, so yeah, done. Um, <laughs> well, uh, first of all, we are very honored and happy that Helen has accepted our invitation to be part of this summit. Uh, Helen Hester is head of film and media at the University of West London. Her research interests include techno-feminism, sexuality studies, and theories of social reproduction. And she's a member of the International Feminist collective Laboria Kubanics. She is the author of Beyond Explicit, Pornography and the Displacement of Sex, the co-editor of the collections Fat Sex, New Directions in Theory and Activism, and Dea Ex Machina, and the editor of Ashgate Sexualities in Society book series. Uh, we invited Hester because it's not only the long march of equal rights that makes Helen's work so necessary. It is a realization of in an increasingly technological and virtual world, the place of, of and our notions of the body, male, female, everything in between and beyond, are in need of a re-articulation. New relations between bodies and machines or apparatuses are called into being, it seems, almost on a daily basis. The intellectual work to understand these new relations and tr strive for or imagine new equilibriums between bodies and machines will shape our place as individuals in the future. Helen's work on that cross-section of feminism, technology, and sexuality excites us. Her thinking contributes 
contributes to ways of imagining new futures and not merely remodeling power structures of the past with a new tech-savvy appearance. It helps us go beyond stubborn stereotypes and gender divisions. We were also very excited about her proposition for today's speak, daringly taking on a subject that even amongst the most open-minded of us could be considered a taboo, reconsidering the notion of the child as a driving agent for the future. Although I am sure all of us, or at least to say most, does not want to imagine a barren earth, Mad Max-ish landscape in a few years' time, as we still await the arrival of the artificial uterus, this is predicted to happen in 2074, um, the fixation on the child as a reason for the future will remain to facilitate the notion of women as reproductive machines. And as goes with machines, if they do not fulfill their particular function, they can be considered either useless, redundant, or even dangerous. Standing here as proud partner of Kunstblock, I imagine, or hope, the future to be expansive, polyphonous, not the narrow, narrowing probability data calculations Willem Schinkel yesterday referred to and rightfully critiqued, but all those possibilities all the time wrapped in moments of pure potential. In our opinion, Helen is part of the voltage, charging that potential. Please welcome Helen Hester. Hi, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and thank you all so much for being here. It's a real pleasure to join you. Um, now, I hope Natalie's not going to be disappointed. I'm not actually, despite this image, I'm not actually talking a lot about uh, the way that the human interacts with the technological, although that, that's in there. I'm thinking about the human as part of an assemblage, but more the way that the humans and non-human animals and the rest of the ecological world uh, intersect and the way that plays into the future. So hopefully you'll see some links between the work I've done before and what I'm doing today. Okay, so in his 2004 book, No Future, Queer Theory and the Death Drive, Lee Edelman takes issue with the future. It is, he argues, a heteronormative construct and the contemporary world is characterized by a reproductive futurism in which the child remains the perpetual horizon of every acknowledged politics the phantasmatic beneficiary of every political intervention. As Edelman puts it, we encounter the disciplinary image of the child on every side as the lives, the speech, and the freedoms of adults face constant threat of legal curtailment out of deference to the imaginary children whose futures, as if they were permitted to have them, except as they consist in the prospect of passing them on to children of their own, are construed as endangered to the social disease as which queer sexualities register. The needs of adults, uh, particularly non-reproductive adults, are constantly subordinated to those of children as bearers of the idea of the future. Edelman's primary examples of this phenomenon are rampant cultural homophobia and so-called pro-life activism. When we think the future, which is largely the terrain of politics, he feels that we inevitably perpetuate a culture laudatory of the child, and therefore supportive of the ideologies of the family that are both hetero and homonormative. Whilst heterosexual sex, or the monogamous dyadic relationship form, are socially sanctioned via the alibi of biological and social reproduction, the queer comes to represent the violent undoing of meaning, the loss of identity and coherence, the unnatural access to jouissance. It is the irredeemable, unrecoverable other. The only proportionate response to this state of affairs uh, is, according to Edelman, refusal. The refusal of politics, the refusal of the future, the refusal of the child. Those beyond the sanctified confines of heteronormativity are, according to his analysis, to embrace the death drive and to become what reproductive futurism has already decided that they are, just a bunch of selfish queers. Edelman's work is quite clearly a polemic, it's like gleefully spooking the straits and denouncing, quote, the fascism of the baby's face, <laughs> which I love. And as such, it's sort of perversely seductive, not to mention seductive in its perversity, and compellingly, charmingly spiteful. It also alerts those of us with an interest in political activism 
to some of the risks inherent in framing the future. And this is really my starting point for today's discussion then. How are ideas about the child and the family mobilised within contemporary activism? And in what ways is this mobilisation problematic? How can we advocate for feminist futures without falling back upon a limited and oppressive vision of the family or counterproductive ideas about protecting the world for our children? And who counts as that our is something I'm going to be exploring. Given that the topic I'm going to be dealing with today is of the future, it's perhaps not surprising that my examples will be drawn primarily from certain forms of mainstream ecological activism. In these cases, what is being fought for is precisely the material conditions needed to sustain a future. The protection of those environmental factors upon which all human and non-human life depend. Within this activism, the image of the child can act as a handy rhetorical shorthand for the future itself, but it cannot do so without also promoting the values of reproductive futurism, including the celebration of the conventional family, the valorization of biological reproduction, and so on. So let's think about the aesthetic framing of climate change activism in Europe and North America at the moment. So, such as the imagery used to promote the People's Climate March in London, New York, Paris, and elsewhere. On posters spread throughout urban transit networks, we encounter this kind of ethereal nymph child, uh, sort of looking wide-eyed into the future and clutching a a toy windmill. (laughs) And note that the two a kind of major figures who are included here appear to be gendered, so gendered as feminine and masculine, thereby bearing the promise of perpetuated monogamous heterosexual coupledom and the biological propagation of the same. So we might think as well about the UN's 2009 Copenhagen advertising campaign, which was used to promote uh, the Copenhagen summit and to raise public awareness about plans for a global global, um, climate change treaty. The campaign relied heavily upon a range of images of young people and made particularly prominent use of cute little uh, blonde haired boys. The environmental advocacy project Environment Illinois, meanwhile, used this image to raise awareness about the health impacts of coal-burning power plants. Writing about this particular advert, the critic Nicole Seymour points out that heterosexism in environmentalism often goes unnoticed and thus unchallenged because it seems so sensible. To wit, the Environment Illinois ad expects an audience for whom the connection between reproductive futurity and environmental protection is a no-brainer. Its strategy also relies upon a mode of address that interpolates the viewer as a current or future participant in the process of species reproduction. So we're all hailed as uh, potential parental protectors here in the expectation that we will unresistingly heed and respond to this call. The reasons behind the use of uh, this kind of familial imagery are pretty clear, I think. Not only is the child now a well-established cultural shorthand for a time yet to come, a time which is increasingly endangered by our actions in the present, but there is widespread social consensus around the idea that appeals of this kind cannot reasonably be refused. Indeed, as Edelman puts it, what value could be so unquestioned because so obviously unquestionable as that of the child whose innocence solicits our defence? So uh, there are very few positions then from which a call to act on behalf of children can justifiably be resisted. And as such, this imagery can be thought of as an effective force for political mobilization. If the child can be so utilized within the course of environmental struggle, if an image of this kind really can motivate people to act, then what's the point of protesting against it? Surely we might say, When it comes to protecting the natural world, it's a case of whatever works. 
But the, the risk, I think, is that relying upon the rhetoric of reproductive futurity cultivates and fosters heterosexist discrimination, both in direct relation to ideas about protecting the environment and more generally in terms of attitudes to sexual dissidence and gender, gender nonconformity. It's the patriarchy. <laughs> there it goes, good. <laughs> Indeed, one could argue that the flip side of this reproductive futurism is the fear of a queer planet. And this is an attitude that's actually detectable within certain kinds of mainstream ecological discourse. Opposition to queer sex, for example, can now strategically borrow from um, advocacy for the natural world. Andil Gosain has commented upon the fact that as overtly homophobic attitudes become less socially acceptable, different kinds of languages are emerging to help incite punitive responses to sex between men. Discussing cultures around public sex, for example, he notes that one of the most popular strategies engaged by police and other opponents of sexual activity in natural spaces is this idea of uh, protection of children. So it's about protecting the children from exposure. Another has been to equate sex with pollution and to focus on the litter and damage to the environment produced by homosexual acts. In both of these approaches, the queer subject becomes a pollutant, not just socially, but literally. He threatens the social body through his supposedly corrupting influence on small children, who apparently make a habit of wandering alone and unawares into gay cruising areas late at night, whilst also threatening the natural world through his selfish production of excess waste. Condoms and lubricant containers, then, are framed as environmentally damaging, and the response to this is to demand the punishment and policing of men who have sex with men, uh, rather than perhaps the more pragmatic approach of installing additional rubbish bins. Not only does non-reproductive sexual activity circulate as a kind of pollutant within cultural uses of environmentalism, but queer subjects themselves are positioned as the result of circulating pollutants. We see this in discourses which attribute non-normative sexual or gender identities to certain forms of environmental exposure. So just like Spider-Man finds himself kind of transformed by via a spider bite, queers are supposedly transformed from normal or a kind of natural state via humanity's long-term exposure to uh, toxins. As Giovanna de Ciro notes, the dominant anti-toxics discourse deployed by mainstream environmentalism adopts the potent rhetoric that toxic chemical pollution is responsible for the undermining or perversion of the natural natural biologies and ecologies, natural bodies, natural reproductive processes. This contemporary environmental anxiety appeals to cultural fears of exposure to chemical and endocrine disrupting toxins as troubling and destabilizing the normal natural gendered body of humans and other animal species. So uh, she argues that there is a fascination with animal indicators of toxic pollution that emphasize the development of either unconventional gender attributes, so such as abnormally tiny alligator penises and um, intersex rats with extra nipples, or non-normative sexual behaviors as seen in cohabiting lesbian herring gulls. So these have been some of the big environmental stories about toxins, have been focusing on these, uh, this sort of disruption of normal gendering and sexuality. The toxic effects of chemical contaminants, in other words, manifest themselves at the level of the compromised and polluted socio-sexual body. These specific results of contamination can come to be emphasized even above effects such as cancer, that is, they are seen as more threatening and more disruptive than morbidity and mortality. To quote one of the most influential popular texts on this topic, Our Stolen Future from 1996, the danger we face is not simply death and disease. By disrupting hormones and development, these synthetic chemicals may be changing who we become, they may be altering our destinies. Now, 
Nobody is suggesting that anti-toxic discourse shouldn't concern itself with the effects of chemical contaminants upon gendered embodiment, or that to do so is somehow inherently discriminatory. Indeed, a number of trans theorists have stressed the need for a proactive theory of synthetic androgens in an era in which hormones do circulate as pollutants and generate unintended environmental effects. However, it should concern us that sexuate diversity is being positioned as a kind of industrial accident, a fate worse than fatal. As Dechiro notes, it seems unwarranted that popular science and journalistic coverage should choose to concentrate quite so much on the seemingly unrelenting offensive on the stability and reliability of the human male reproductive capacity and sexual orientation. There is perhaps an over-reliance here upon ideas about natural sexuality and gender. That is, a concern with reproduction as the means by which the future is secured, not simply in terms of biomaterial conditions, but in terms of normative socio-sexual conditions as well. The anxiety, as expressed in Our Stolen Future, is not so much that the species will cease to exist, but that it might be changed or altered. What has been stolen is the ability to guarantee sameness, the unquestioned replication of established forms of gendered embodiment and sexual subjectivity. In this sense, of course, many of us might aspire to be toxic queers, working to undermine things as they are in favor of different and more emancipatory futures. After all, we might ask, for whom is an unchanged future actually an inviting prospect? Here, in a different form, we encounter the influence of reproductive futurism as it trenches upon environmentalism. Not simply a call for action on behalf of the child, but the stigmatization of non-reproductive sex and improperly reproductive bodies. In positioning ecological activism as agitation on behalf of generations to come then, we may unwillingly participate in the cult of the child that is so central to determining which lives are prioritized, whose needs are seen to matter, and which bodies are framed as threatening pollutants or undesirable side effects. So what does this mean then? Should we just sign up to Edelman's strategy of refusal and withdrawal? Should we join him in giving up on politics and dismissing it in its entirety as the terrain of family values? I don't think so. Living for the now and saying fuck the future hardly seems like an apt response to impending ecological disaster. And indeed, the fact that Edelman's analysis largely proceeds via queer readings of classic Hollywood cinema suggests that such crises are not really within his purview. He's not actually considering the brute reality of the contemporary Anthropocene here. So perhaps it's a bit unfair to frame his argument in these terms. And yet, the undesirable implications of no future remain. Nina Power is amongst those who have sketched out an objection to Edelman's account of reproductive futurity. She points out some of the ways in which Edelman's seemingly radical position plays into existing structures of neoliberalism, remarking that capitalism depends upon the reproduction of sameness in the guise of difference, the idea that there is no alternative and that no future in the sense of new ways of living is possible. She also comments that Edelman's conflation of politics with the future with the child does not hold in every situation. The question of a queer, that is non-futural, resistance to communal relations has in fact been an issue for various 20th century political movements. There have been uh, various kinds of queer resistance to the organizing principle of heteronormativity which have, at the same time, been explicitly political projects. Uh, so power gives the example of the kibbutz movement, to which we might add no numerous forms of sort of uh, eco-queer activism and theory. I would also question Edelman's position from the point of view of solidarity with reproductive laborers. Whatever his position on actual caregivers, it's clear that the author has precious little sympathy with the cultural figure of the parent. 
So uh, take this footnote from his introduction, for example. Narcissism, the cry will go up. Who, after all, more self-denying, more willing to sacrifice than a parent? Who more committed to hours of work without getting paid? Not paid. Consult the ledger book of social approbation. Tax codes, baby registries, the various forms of parental leave. These, of course, all pale before the costs of raising a child. But pronatalism's payoff isn't primarily measured in dollars or cents. It's registered in the universal confirmation of one's standing as an adult and in the accrual of social capital that allows one a stake in the only futures market that ever really counts. So th the resentment here seems palpable, I think. Even in the author's faintly begrudging list of the marginal financial rewards associated with parenthood. Raising a child may well, for some, bring with it an influx of social capital to offset financial losses, as those of us who are um, refused access to that social capital are already well aware. But man cannot live by social capital alone, and the exhaustion, impoverishment and exploitation by white patriarchal capitalism of many caregivers and reproductive labourers deserves more than the dismissive treatment meted out here. Of course, the vaunting of reproduction and the distribution of social capital are in no way evenly distributed phenomena. The wealthy white yummy mummy might be applauded for her contribution to the future of the nation state, but teenage girls, black and Latina mothers, trans and genderqueer subjects, immigrants and refugees, single parent families, benefits recipients, people in the third world and so on receive no such treatment. Jose Esteban Munoz makes a, rel a related point in his book Cruising Utopia, The Then and There of Queer Futurity, at this time from the point of view of the child. He notes that, quote, in the same way all queers are not the stealth universal white gay man, all children are not the privileged white babies to whom society caters. The future is only the stuff of some kids, racialized kids, queer kids, are not the sovereign princes of futurity. So all of this is very useful in that it prompts us to uh, approach the givers and receivers of care in a different way. It demands that feminists ask new questions. How can we support those engaged in social reproduction or social safety net of social capital? How can we act in solidarity with those who are depended upon by others and who make a huge and frequently under-recognised social and political contribution via their feminised regenerative labour? Munoz's call for utopia is an important rejoinder to Edelman and is instructive in the framework that it offers for thinking queer. Not contra the future, but as the unrealised, the emergent and the still to come. He declares that straight time tells us that there is no future but the here and now of our everyday life. The only future promised is that of reproductive majoritarian heterosexuality, the spectacle of the state refurbishing its ranks through overt and subsidised acts of reproduction. Rather than using this as a basis to reject the future, however, Munoz incorporates it into a rallying cry for new and better futures. It is important not to hand over futurity to normative white reproductive futurity. That dominant mode of futurity is indeed winning, but this is all the more reason to call on a utopian political imagination that will enable us to glimpse another time and place, and not yet, where queer youths of colour actually get to grow up. And to this, we might add, where more various forms of silicon and carbon-based actors can subsist coexist and thrive. But whilst we can accept that utopia has a function in galvanising the political imaginary, there are still insights from Edelman that we need to adopt and incorporate. In acting on behalf of future generations, we must be careful not to foster the supreme value of species survival as a discursive technology of compulsory heterosexuality. As I have suggested, to the extent that we frame our activism as protecting the earth for our children, 
we risk promoting restrictive, exclusionary and inhospitable notions of whose existence counts. Most obviously, by indirectly privileging lines of genetic descent and cultural inheritance, such approaches are distinctly speciesist, neglectful of the many other forms of life upon which environmental change might impact. How then can we think reproduction, even just in the sense of ensuring the survival of others into the future, without also reproducing the worst of reproductive futurity? At this point, I would like to turn to the work of Donna Haraway, who has done so much over the years in terms of helping us to view our species within its wider biological and techno-material context. In an article for Environmental Humanities, published last year, Haraway offers a new slogan for the era of climate change. Make kin, not babies. This, quite clearly, is a slogan of two parts. Perhaps the easiest directive to grasp is the suggestion that we, as a species, reduce our birth rate. Official UN population projections now suggest that the number of people inhabiting the planet will pass the 10 billion mark by the end of the century, contributing to significant problems in food availability and affordability. Studies suggest that this situation may be significantly exacerbated by the environmental crisis, with climate change resulting in global crop yield losses of up to 30% by 2080. There are understandable fears that the carrying capacity of the planet and of particular regions may be exceeded as local environments approach the maximal population loads that they can support. This would risk detrimental effects not just on human lives, but on other species as well, hence Haraway's suggested check on fertility. Over a couple of hundred years from now, she muses, maybe the human people of this planet can again be numbered two or three billion or so, while all along the way being part of increasing well-being for diverse human beings and other critters as means and not just ends. Whatever challenges a surge in human numbers might bring, however, it is important to note that population density is but one factor in the complicated issue of environmental strain. Wasteful and unsustainable methods of production, combined with learned habits of commodity and resource consumption, play a primary role in eroding the conditions that quite literally make life livable. As Sarah Fisher points out, however, both patterns of consumption and production and numbers of people influence demand for and pressures on natural resources, food, water, shelter, fuel, and so on. Given the pressing nature of the global environmental challenges we face, we should be drawing on all potentially beneficial strategies at our disposal, addressing both consumption and population-related factors. Whilst acknowledging the need to confront the systemic effects of capitalism then, I stand with Haraway in her call to make kin, not babies, at least in as far as it extends to the privileged classes of, contemporary, um, of the contemporary global north. Here, making babies too often involves massive resource consumption and waste generation within energy inefficient and labour intensive single family homes. To askew the deliberate extension of one's genetic line, that is, to engage in the pollarding of one's family tree, may help us to rethink modes of intimacy, sociability and solidarity beyond the nexus of white Western nuclear families. In some ways, this approach is a corrective to contemporary tendencies in environmental activism that look predominantly to the global south when proposing checks to population growth. As Gosine remarks, North American environmental movements have invested in the production and circulation of discourses on overpopulation that pit blame for global ecological disaster on the reproducing proclivities of the world's poor. Due to the easy collaboration of capitalism with patriarchy and racism, that has meant the economically dispossessed non-white peoples of the world, particularly childbearing or potentially childbearing women from Asia, Africa and South and Central America, as well as First Nations and non-white women in North America. As such, Western environmentalism's use of reproductive futurism has tended to be most virulent when it comes to representing affluent white families. 
the procreative proclivities of non-white people, especially those from the global south, have instead been regarded as dangerously perverse. And this brings us on to the second part of Haraway's proposed slogan for the Anthropocene, making kin. This is the productive moment hitched to her negation of the current order. In her 2015 article, she declares that if there is to be multi-species eco-justice, which can also embrace diverse human people, it is high time that feminists exercise leadership in the imagination, theory and action to unravel the ties of both genealogy and kin, and kin and species. In other words, current ecological conditions demand a feminism that practices better care of kinds assemblages, not a species one at a time, and which prompts us to rethink the existences and relationships that our politics tend to privilege. Kin is the concept that Haraway mobilizes in an attempt to cultivate this, an assembling sort of word that, of course, speaks of solidarity beyond reproductive futurism. In calling for the making of kin rather than the making of babies, we speak of a less naturalized, a less inward-looking, and less parochial form of both intra- and interspecies alliance. We do need to qualify this rallying call not to make babies, however. When Edelman discusses what it means to resist the appeal of futurity, to refuse the temptation to reproduce, he appears to rather sidestep the fact that biological procreation is not always an expressly planned or deliberately sought for process. Even if the provision of abortion was secure and the procedure itself culturally destigmatized, it seems likely that many pregnancies not chosen in advance would still, uh, for complex and sometimes personal reasons, be allowed to continue to term. And of course, who would want to step in to forcibly prevent people from having children? I can hardly imagine Donna Haraway advocating for the imposition of fertility control upon the unwilling masses. <laughs> so definitely not Haraway style. Her demand must instead be seen as a call for fostering an ideological shift. That is, for an ambitious attempt to wrest hegemony away from reproductive futurity. Indeed, her vision of population reduction encompasses centuries rather than decades. As such, we need to marry any advocacy for the reduction of human population size with both an anti-racist, anti-imperialist politics and a commitment to acting in solidarity with the impregnatable and with caregivers. This is especially crucial as regards those whose access to the social capital of parenthood is drastically limited. The world's displaced, racialized, impoverished, queer and otherwise stigmatized subjects. There is reason to hope, perhaps, that a reorientation away from reproductive futurity and towards various models of kinship and xeno-solidarity might actually encourage a deeper hospitality towards these groups. That any move towards a generalized cultural rejection of the family line might be framed less as the dismissal of parents and guardians and more as an act of solidarity with new arrivals of various kinds, from migrants to new caregivers to the very young. In this paper, I've argued that reproductive futurism should be considered a problem for those of us with an interest in eco-activism. It is a trap that, as Edelman's work attests, risks tripping up anybody who is trying to think the future. Much agitation on behalf of the child, so often conflated with any world yet to come, tends to uphold heterosexist ideologies and monogamous nuclear family structures as an inadvertent result of the discursive patterning that shapes our cultural world. As Nia Power and Jose Esteban Nunoz suggest, however, there is more to the future than reproductive futurity. It is possible to have a politics beyond the horizon of the family, and it is possible to have a queer feminist activism underpinned by the enabling affect of hope. Indeed, the judicious mobilization of such a future-oriented affect may be necessary if we wish to create conditions that are hospitable to re-engineering a present that, for many human and non-human actors, is unbearable. 
Entertaining the possibility of emancipatory projects beyond reproductive futurity is important, I have argued, if we wish to develop a collective eco and gender politics that fights for the continued existence of all our alien kin. If we want to develop a feminism fit for the era of the Anthropocene, we need to insist upon the myriad interconnections between capitalism, gender politics, population and ecology. With Munoz then, I assert that we must vacate the here and now for a then and there. Individual transports are insufficient. We need to engage in a collective temporal distortion. Thank you very much.